Welcome to Part B on scheduling. We had a question a, a second ago while I was switching on, on what I meant by a Gantt chart. And basically, all I meant was a schedule for your machines. So here's M1, M2, and it would be job one. And maybe job one goes over there. Job two. And then job three here. <coughs> Basically a chart that lays this out. And this is typically called a planning board or even a Gantt chart. I know most of you who have done project management think of a Gantt chart a little bit differently, but just shows the jobs and where they are in time. Um, most electronic systems that do scheduling typically allow you to move things around on this chart, readjust the schedule, an electronic planning board, okay? Now, scheduling is a difficult area, okay? Um, people typically find production planning a lot easier than scheduling. And oftentimes, people confuse production planning problems with scheduling problems. And so, whenever somebody says they have a scheduling problem, you really ought to pick your favorite engineering management technique to do a root cause analysis. Six Sigma or five Ys. You know, ask why five times. Well. The schedule's always bad. Why? We don't have the parts. And so jobs get delayed. Well, are you, are you talking about a scheduling problem anymore? No, you're talking about production planning problem because they're missing parts. Or the machine breaks down. Is it a scheduling problem or is it a maintenance problem? Okay, scheduling is important, but it's very difficult to automate. And, and I would prefer to have an inventory problem or, a shop or an MRP problem to a shop floor scheduling problem for implementation reasons because of the issue of nervousness and a whole bunch of other reasons. And this is my personal commentary, not for the test. Um, actual performance of the schedule is as critical as forward planning. So if you're going to go to the trouble to, to build a schedule, you also ought to go to the trouble to track when jobs are completed based on the schedule to make sure that people are adhering to processing time standards and that everything's correct. And this is true for MRP as well as scheduling. You want to track plan versus actual and find out reasons why the plan numbers don't actually equal the actual numbers. And the great news is that today data is available into the control system, so, but it just takes work to integrate that data with the planning system. Many scheduling problems are difficult to solve um, but you can develop, develop optimal solution techniques, integer programming, dispatching rules, metaheuristics are all often employed. And so what you want to do is you want to first develop an objective. And typically people care about tardiness, number of late jobs, uh, maybe average completion time, or a combination of the aforementioned. And then find your favorite um, heuristic, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, taboo search, make sure it works. So scheduling systems typically have a Gantt chart or an electronic visualization planning board so you can see what every machine's supposed to do and see how jobs flow through the system. They have some sort of optimization procedure to develop the schedule. They allow for manual data entry and interface. Um, they allow for some rescheduling procedure. Typically drag and drop would be the best. They have reports to give you historic times, flow due dates, and they have monitoring Maybe if a job's running late, you send a message, right? This is what you need to do. What happens? Job is late on the floor. That information that the job can't be finished on time, who's going to care about it? Is, is obviously, the, the, the plant will care about it because it counts against them, but who else needs to know? Someone on the sales side, right? Whoever sold it needs to know that job's late so that they can take the appropriate action, correct? And not only that, but they need what? A good idea of how late. If you tell a salesman the job's late, that's worse than telling him nothing at all. Why? Because he calls the customer and he can't answer the question, when am I getting it? Okay? So this whole, whole area of monitoring is really critical. Um, 
obviously, each vent, if you're implementing one of these systems, you, any IT system, and this could be SAP, it could be the scheduling system, you want to work with the vendor who sold you the system, and typically you do it in a series of organized steps. You have a prepare, pre, pre, prepare phase or a kickoff phase where you define the problem. You have some IT development work where they interface the software to work within the organization. You test it, and the testing should include user acceptance, where you do a conference room pilot, bring everybody in, here's how you use the system. You train them, you go live, and then you evaluate um, whether it worked. And we're going to spend a little time in lecture nine, and different organizations will call these steps different things, but those are the basic steps of, of implementing software. Now, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to discuss three heuristics that can be applied beyond scheduling. Um, and, you know, the, these are good heuristics. If you're interested, take the heuristics course offered by Dr. Marquez, usually in the fall. What is a heuristic? It's an algorithm that attempts to find a good solution to the problem. For scheduling problems, you can either have some heuristics with performance bounds, but, but most meta heuristics don't have performance bounds. And a classic heuristic is if I schedule a parallel machine taking the longest job first, I'm guaranteed to be within four-thirds minus one-third divided by M um, of the optimal schedule. And I'm not going to go through and prove that. But um, So a heuristic approach to scheduling. First thing is we have to find an objective, such as tardiness or number of late jobs. And then we have to pick your favorite algorithm, simulating annealing, genetic algorithms, taboo search, and then test the heuristic. Both simulated annealing and genetic algorithms work on the concept of neighborhood search. And for scheduling, this is fairly easy. You typically define the neighborhood based on pairwise exchange or moving a single job, okay? So I could have my schedule here. <laughs> I'm just going to do a single machine. And remember, your real system is going to have hundreds of jobs. So a neighborhood would be, I could do a single, move a single job. So I randomly pick a job and then randomly insert it somewhere else in the schedule. Or I could do a swap neighborhood and swap those two. So if I did a swap of A and C, my new schedule would be C, B, A, D instead of A, B, C, D. Everybody get that? Now, simulated annealing is a neighborhood search procedure where, where we're, we're allowing worse schedules with some probability. Okay? And so I have my big schedule here. And... whatever the schedule is. And I, 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 let's say I'm moving one as my neighborhood. I move that there. I recompute the schedule and compute a cost, okay? If it costs less this schedule than my original schedule, I'll, I'll do it. Now, what happens if it costs more? Well, with simulated annealing, you give some probability to accept a worse schedule. And the reason is it lets you get out of local optimal solutions. So if you think about it, And this is, let's think about a single dimension optimization. Okay? Simulated annealing, let's try to say I'm trying to find the minimum and I'm here. And I'm moving small distances. Well, if I'm never allowed to take a worse solution, I'll never get over the hill and then down to the, new, the low point. Okay? So... <laughs> So we start the search with some initial schedule, and we randomly change the schedule based on a neighborhood, right? If it's an improvement, we keep it. If it's worse, we accept it. Or if it's improvement, we always accept it. If it's worse, we accept it with some probability. And the probability of accepting it is typically based on a cooling schedule. And so if the new schedule's better, you always accept it. And if it's worse, 
you accept it with some probability based on how bad it is, okay? And a temperature factor. And the reason why they call it a cooling schedule is the idea is at the start, you want it to be like a metal that's hot. What happens in hot metal? The, the atoms get mixed up, right? And over time, you want to you stop allowing bad changes and only focus on good changes. So, you know, simulated annealing typically works pretty good. And it's very easy to program. Um, the, the real key to all of these is, did I correctly define my objective and neighborhood? Did I generate a good cooling schedule? Um, you can restart the procedure multiple times, and usually it's going to find a pretty good schedule. Another alternative is genetic algorithms, where I construct Q schedules. I select the best Q schedules, and then um, I replace the, the, the worst Q schedules with a change to the best. Okay? And over time, um, a neighborhood change to one of the best. So with, with genetic algorithms, the whole idea is I have a whole bunch of schedules, right? And then I, I take the best of that group somehow, based on some probability, I select favor the ones that are better, make a small change to all of them, and then keep doing that many times, and over time I'll tend to find good schedules is the idea. So genetic algorithms are somewhat or analogous to evolution in some way. Um, there are many different rules and approaches for genetic algorithms, and on some problems they work pretty good. Um, if you go to a Google Scholar and search genetic algorithms, you'll find um, millions of papers, a million papers. It's kind of funny because they were popular. Another way is just pick a dispatching rule and then improve it with a local search and continue doing this by um, over and over again, slightly modifying the parameters of the dispatching rule. You know, what heuristic works best is problem specific. The key is to pick a reasonable neighborhood and search parameters. Um, test your heuristic against competitors to find out which one runs best. The list of reasonable heuristics is long. There's ant colony, there's bee colony, uh, uh, taboo search, a um, whole list of them. And honestly, anybody in this class could develop their own heuristic. Idea is you construct the schedule, you figure out a mechanism for improvement, right? And you just run it over and over again. And I presented genetic algorithms and simulated annealing briefly since they're easy to code and very common. Um, several scheduling specific um, heuristics have been developed like shifted bottleneck, but that's well beyond the scope of this class. You know, for more information, look up scheduling online in, in, in Google Scholar or Science Direct. Also, um, Chapter 6 of Pinedo has a great on, um, a chapter on heuristics and dispatching roles. And so we've covered a little bit on simulated annealing and genetic algorithms, sort of following Pinedo's approach. And this lecture is intended as a quick introduction to a complex topic. So... Let me, let me go through genetic algorithms since I think I rushed that one. And I'm out of paper. That's not good. But basically, you have a population of schedules. So I generate 100 schedules, right? And let's say I take the top 10 and make small changes to them and replace all 100. If I do that over and over again... Uh, assuming I took enough of them and was able to maintain a large enough population, etc., eventually you'll come up with a schedule that's hopefully pretty good. Okay? Um, same with simulated annealing, right? I, I start at a point, I, I always take improvements, I sometimes take worse schedules. If I do that enough, hopefully I'll move to a really good schedule. Okay? And so if you if you know. Those two, if I ever ask a test question on either of those, it would be um, what algorithm uses a population? Genetic algorithm or simulated annealing? Somebody take a guess. Which one uses a population of schedules? Genetic, Genetic algorithm. Um, which algorithm allows a worse schedule to be accepted with some probability? 
simulated annealing. Okay? And so, you know, that, that will be the focus. Um, undergraduates, you don't have to do the SAP project part C, but you do have to read through the SAP slides that are posted in Blackboard. Everybody was able to download those slides. And, and mind you, I want you to read, summarize them in three pages so that you truly understand um, the verbiage of SAP. It'll benefit you. Um, if you really want benefit from the assignment, go ahead and download SAP on your computer, log in, do a couple of screens. I'll give you some bonus points, do all of it. I'll give you a lot of bonus points. And graduate students, you're stuck doing both either way, okay? So with that, um, have a good night, and I'll see you guys later. Thank <laughs> you.